Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. I'm Jennifer Jarlin, the chairman of the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. Welcome back to those of you who've joined us for the series this week. And forgive me for repeating myself if you have been on all those calls. But for those of you that are just joining us today, I wanted to note that IFSC is a not-for-profit organization working to advance diversion and composting of organics in Illinois with a focus on food scraps. We foster the growth and sustainability of the composting industry through our work as connector, educator, creator of programs, and supporter of market expansion in Illinois. Uh-oh, my slides are not advancing. There we go. Uh-oh, my slides are not here today for some reason. They disappeared. So that's all right. Our members and partners represent a wide spectrum of stakeholders, including community and government organizations, businesses, schools, institutions, service providers, compost processors, and individuals. Please follow us on social media, um, and those are all on our website, to see all of the really super news about the growing success of the Illinois compost movement. IFSC is your local compost coalition, and the United States Composting Council, USCC, is a national composting authority. We're connected through them because we are the national, uh, the, we are the state committee of that national council. So uh, the membership information for both of those is on one of my missing slides that you've seen the last couple of days. But if you're not already a member, we encourage you all to join in the collaboration because it's your involvement and knowledge that makes our organization more effective. And uh, please, please do consider joining us. The theme for this year's International Compost Awareness Week, as I'm sure you're aware, is Grow, Eat, Compost, Repeat. Each day this week, we've dug into one element of that cycle. And like a holiday feast, I am so full with all that we've learned this week, um, but yet I want just a little bit more. So today we circle back to the buffet for seconds and repeat the process. A big thank you to today's speakers who will share their stories about completing the circle by rescuing food scraps and other organic material from a fate in the landfill and instead turning it into a nutrient rich soil amendment that will be returned to the earth in which we grow our food. The IFSC committees of interest to people who are into this part of the cycle are the Compost Market Development Committee and the Wheat Compost Recognition Program Committee, to name a couple. On behalf of the IFSC Board of Directors, our active committees, and the planning committee, who did so much work for this online educational series, I thank you all for attending. Great, thanks, Jen. So I think we're gonna get started. I'm really grateful that you could join us on this rainy Thursday. My name is Amy DiLorenzo and I'm an extension educator at the University of Illinois and the Discovery Partners Institute. And I'm also the co-chair of the IFSC Communications Committee. The Communication Committee's goal is to equitably strengthen the composting community and support organizations and individuals to expand access, awareness, and distribution of IFSC resources. And so, as Jen mentioned, I'm pleased to host today's chat, which is called Repeat, with Doug Bradley from Saber at McCormick Place and Andy Kling from Midwest Organics. The theme of Repeat here is timely because we will be learning about the work that McCormick Place does by composting its food scraps, the processing of those scraps uh, into compost by Midwest Organics, and then the application of that compost back onto the rooftop of McCormick Place, which, turns, uh, which in turn grows food for Saber. It's a great closed loop system in the convention center's backyard. So first we're gonna hear from Doug Bradley. Doug has more than 20 years developing operationally effective sustainability programs for large food service operations in the United States, China, and the United Kingdom. Doug created the Planet Evergreen Sustainable Cuisine Program for Aramark Sports and Entertainment Executive Chefs in 2005, served as the culinary expert and directed the sustainability program for the athletes dining in the London 2012 Summer Games. And taking his accumulated expertise in sustainability back to the United States, Bradley served as the Director of Culinary and Sustainability at the prestigious Cleveland Clinic before transitioning to lead um, Saber's culinary team. 
As Sabre's vice president of culinary, based at Chicago's McCormick Place, Doug has created a model for Sabre accounts globally, emphasizing biodiversity in McCormick's rooftop garden, increasing waste diversion across the food service operation, and maximizing integration into local communities. Um, Andy Klink is the compost site manager for Midwest Organics Recycling and has recently completed his sixth year at Midwest Organics. After graduating in 2010 from Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois with a BA in Spanish and business, he traveled the Midwest working at small organic family farms in order to learn more about gardening, animal husbandry, and as a byproduct, compost. In 2015, he came across the position at MOR and has continued his pursuit to help make his community more economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable, which are also my top three favorite things about compost. In his free time, he enjoys gardening, playing basketball, and cooking, and he lives in Crystal Lake, Illinois, with his wife, Riley, and his dog, Arrow. So each presenter is going to speak today, followed by time for questions for both. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat, and we're going to be monitoring that throughout the talk. So Doug, uh, you're up. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Appreciate that. We can go, uh, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to take a minute uh, and, and thank everybody that uh, joined the, the call today uh, to, to hear what uh, Andy and I had to, to, to speak to. So hopefully you'll find some value in it and uh, it'll help you with uh, your composting journey as well. I do also want to call out that uh, Jennifer, I, uh, I love the, uh, all the, the food analogies in your um, opening remarks. It's uh, perfect because, uh, um, next slide, um, and it, it at his heart, uh, Sabre uh, down at McCormick, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the, the space, uh, let me talk a little bit about that piece that uh, uh, we have a total of four convention halls. Uh, we have one arena that's attached to it as well. There's three main kitchens that support the food production in that building. And um, we're doing an excess in normal years, we're doing an excess of um, about $40 million a year. And one of the things that uh, I think most of the people on the call would also know is uh, we are ecstatic internally and I think is externally as well in the city of Chicago because we just got the notification this last Tuesday that we're reopening in July. So that's uh, great news, amazing news. Uh, we actually may have some uh, basketball games going on over in the Wintrust Arena sooner than that. So after that shameless plug for what's going on down there with food, we do have the auto show is one of the first major shows we'll have uh, coming in in July. Uh, so we're going to be relaunching and really getting our, our programs back uh, running and, and have more to talk to about that in the future here. Uh, next slide. And then why do we, why do, we do it? Uh, basically, when, when you look at, uh, I think, the best of, of culinary businesses, we take what uh, what we follow and what we try to incorporate in everything we do from the very start of, of restaurants. And the idea was to restore people. So to restore the folks that come to visit us, restore the communities we live in, uh, to build them out and to help uh, integrate into them and, and share the, uh, the opportunities that come with a, an operation like a McCormick Place is something that uh, is key to us. Uh, and certainly the uh, impact that we have on the environment with all the food that we supply and the uh, elements that would potentially have an impact on the environment um, that, that could be negative with putting items into landfill, we try to, to prevent that as much as possible as well. Next slide. So one of the things, uh, we called out the rooftop garden because the tie that we have with the, the, the composting and the, the fact that uh, Midwest uh, and the Windy City, uh, not Midwest, was, excuse me, the uh, Botanic Garden and um, uh, our Windy City Harvest folks that manage the garden for us. They're uh, tied obviously into the community, but they also uh, use the composting pieces. They have a very um, forward looking piece uh, and are an inspiration to how we operate and how we uh, go to, uh, to business down at uh, McCormick. The idea that we have a 20,000 square foot plus uh, garden up on the west rooftop is something that um, is an inspiration to us. Uh, if you're worn down during the, the days in the summertime or the early fall and you take a trip up to the garden and see the things that are growing up there, uh, it's relaxing, it's uh, uh, enervating and uh, kind of uh, helps rebuild your spirit uh, as, you're, as you're going about your daily business to know that that's going on up there and, and it has all the positive impact that it does. Uh, it's an inspiration to us and, and it's just a key part of how we operate. Next slide. Relative to that, besides growing plants, uh, we have a broad diversity of, of 
uh, arc of taste plants. I don't want to talk too much about this. I want to get uh, down to our slides on, on composting, but we uh, keep honeybees up on the rooftop. Uh, obviously, we get some honey from them. We try to, to leave as much as possible to the bees, but still uh, pull out uh, some that we can make available and, and help to tell the story about what we're doing with uh, the bee crops up there, or the bee uh, hives up there. Next slide. That this, this is where we start to talk a little bit uh, about what we do with uh, local businesses and our push to integrate and share the, uh, the opportunities we have there that uh, obviously as a food company, we could partner with a lot of folks to provide uh, alcohol and, and other beverages, other food. Um, but what we did here was uh, we grow hops up on the roof and it's a key element that goes into our uh, Brickstone beer. It's made down in uh, Bourbon A. Uh, it's, uh, it was the first beer that was launched like this uh, that was proprietary to a convention center. Uh, we're really proud of, of that accomplishment and uh, not only the fact that, that we put this in place and we sell a ton of uh, that beer that actually uh, Brickstone is able to put it into Binnie's uh, and into Jewel Osco. They'll be doing that again as uh, we come back out of the, the pandemic. Uh, but this is also something that's been copied by other convention centers around the country. And we think that there's uh, just a huge upside to that that uh, not, when, when you do something in McCormick Place, whether it's with your food or whether it's with your composting, it sets a standard that we think everybody else in the industry does follow. Uh, and we've, we've got some good test result from that. Next page. The last piece I wanna really talk about the garden is just, uh, of course, having hyper-local produce. Uh, it absolutely, uh, the, the, the best part of it is the fact that we can use that food in the uh, dishes that we bring to bear for uh, our customers. We also have, um, in this last year, obviously we didn't have any access or any use for the produce that was being grown up there. Because when we started the year, it looked like in 2020, we thought, ah, oh, you know, July, August, we'll be back. So uh, we need to plant the garden. So we planted the garden, but even as we put the, the seeds in the ground and started growing things, um, we kept in mind that we might not be back. And we made arrangements so that all the uh, produce that was uh, grown up there was either donated to a uh, shelter that was in need of those products, or it was sold at uh, the local farmers markets to uh, raise money for Windy City Harvest. So um, it was a good use of what that product was. And we've started, we've relaunched again this year. Uh, fortunately, it does look right now knocking on a little proverbial wood, uh, like we will be back, but that's something that um, we're, uh, we've uh, replanted the garden and we're expecting to be able to start to uh, share that, uh, the great food we get out of it with our customers, as well as helping support Windy City Harvest. So next slide. Now about that waste diversion and how we, we manage it and how we drive what we're doing uh, down at McCormick, it starts with our, with our event managers that come in and meet with us. And you can imagine uh, when you're talking about the quantities of food that we'll serve down there that you know, the last major events that we did down at McCormick, uh, we are serving over 15,000 people at a sitting. And if you think about the, the estimate of, uh, you know, if it's seven, eight, 10 grams per plate, you know, a quarter ounce, half an ounce of food where you may have missed your estimates uh, of how much food you needed uh, or how much was ordered by our clients, our customers, then you have a massive amount of food waste that has to be uh, dealt with. And while we can put that in compost and we'd like to start first with our, uh, with our event managers to talk to them about what they're planning and how we can help them manage that waste uh, more effectively so that people are full and fed, but that they're not overfed and leaving uh, a large amount of uh, food scrap behind. Next slide. So the next thing we did was, uh, and this is something that uh, I'll mention again when we get to taking action is that one of the things that, that I observed over the years when I'm dealing with this is, is I think most people try to do the right thing, whether it's because they're with people that are doing the right thing and trying to sort their waste appropriately for your waste streams that are post-consumer. To be clear, this is about post-consumer waste. Um, they try to do the right thing, but the fact is, is you have just minuscule amount of time that's available to you before they're walking with colleagues, they're walking with friends, they're talking, they wanna keep moving on with their day and you gotta capture them in that, that few moments. Otherwise you're talking about potential contamination to your stream. So one of the things we've done is we made signage that basically wasn't generic. So if you look closely on some of those, I think you can see at that time, this is a little bit dated in terms of the signage, we've updated this, but 
Uh, at that time, um, the, the Starbucks cups we were using were not compostable. So they went down on the landfill piece. So somebody walking out with one of our compostable cups could say, oh, okay, great. This cup looks like this, it goes in this bin, and that cup looks like that from Starbucks, and it goes in that bin. So from that perspective, um, you have to stay up on it, but this is easily done in terms of uh, looking at you know what you can do with PowerPoint or uh, Word or Publisher, any of those, you can make your own internal signs that support your waste streams and really communicate exactly what you want where. So next slide. Another thing we did was we looked at our staffing and this, this program we put in place about eight years ago at this point. <clears throat> and basically it's a, we call it Green Angels. Uh, and what we do is our staff, originally these, the, the, the folks were working as bussers in our uh, brick and mortar locations. So they'd go around and do the typical busing things that, uh, you know, they clear tables and, and pick up trash that was left on the, the floor of uh, the tables and wipe them down. But we were able to repurpose what many of those folks did and put them behind a waste sorting uh, area so that basically our customers now just bring the tray up and drop it on the, the counter and the uh, folks will go ahead and sort the product out and put it in the right bins behind the counter. So uh, we saw a uh, large uptick, uh, you'll see that in our numbers in a minute, uh, in terms of our uh, compostability uh, and being able to maintain all of those streams between recycling, uh, landfill and, and composting. Next slide. The other thing we did, which is a little off the, the track from, from composting, but I think it, it still reuses those organic scraps. Uh, when I'm talking organic, I don't mean organic food specifically. I'm talking about food scraps in general. So this is not, can't put the compostable uh, flatware or plates or cups or that kind of thing into this machine. But basically what it is, it's a large grinder. Uh, if you think about a, um, what you have is a, is a garbage disposable in your house, it's like that, but uh, on steroids, much larger. Uh, and we basically, we grind everything that comes out of our South Kitchen. It goes into a slurry that's stored in this 3000 gallon tank. Uh, it gives us an automatic uh, update in terms of when it needs to be emptied. And then uh, we call the, the hauler to take it down to um, one of the local anaerobic uh, digesters that they operate at a uh, wastewater treatment plant. And then it's converted into, um, uh, gas and, uh, and fertilizer pieces. You can see some of the numbers from, this is one of the slices that we took. Uh, it gives you a nice reporting piece in terms of what your diversion rates have impacted in terms of generating energy, reducing uh, CO2, and then also um, what happens with the uh, uh, fertilizer. Next slide. Waste diversion, uh, the, uh, it's measured in tons, just to tell you, and you can see here, we cut this off at 2017. The next uh, uh, years are a little bit uh, skewed. We're looking forward to, probably because in 2020, we have massive amounts of diversion because uh, we were able to donate a, a tremendous amount of product. And I didn't want to put up something that um, really told a story that, that um, isn't, it, you know, isn't true to what, how we normally operate. But you can see from when we started down there to where we are currently, uh, we've nearly doubled the amount of diversion that we are at. And I can tell you that uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, event uh, planners and how important that is and how an event manages itself as well. So when we work with people like Green Build, which is a show we did uh, a couple of years back at this point, they'll hit as high as an 85% diversion rate uh, because they're all in, in tune. They're all aware of what we're trying to do and they participate in the program. And it's one of the things I think is... Uh, made the, the program as successful as it can be and that will moving into the future as we continue to grow on that awareness and that um, the role that they have, uh, we're able to, to continue to grow that. Next slide. And then taking action, a couple of things, please. If you got questions, you got uh, comments, you got thoughts uh, beyond what goes on the, the chat uh, today or the questions that come up on this presentation, please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out to me personally. Uh, and also there's a uh, website you can have a look at uh, and get some more information about what the overall program is down at, uh, at McCormick. But how you can do things, obviously McCormick is a massive operation. Like I said, we did uh, north of $40 million in uh, the last year we were operating. And when you're, when you're looking at that, you have a lot of resource you can bring to bear on a program like this. But some of the things I think anybody can do is going back to the signage that how do you communicate what you want where in your waste streams, both for your staff as well as for the, the, the consumers that are coming in and, and consume your food. 
Um, again, this is really largely for those operations that are doing food service, but it could fit in any business in general. Um, don't know that it applies exactly to home, but maybe if you got kids and that kind of thing, it helps show them where you want what, right? But um, the other piece is can you repurpose staff so that they're not just busing or, or sweeping or, but they're actively helping in what goes on in terms of the sorting pieces. And then finally, is there technology you can take advantage of that helps in that process? Uh, whether it's using, you know, uh, software programs to help print signage as things change for what you have in your waste streams and, and where it should be going, or if it's something as complicated and complex as that uh, grind to energy piece. And thank you for your attention. Thanks, Doug. That was fantastic. Um, so we're going to hold questions for now and move on to Andy's presentation. And Andy has a video from out in the field that he is going to share with us. Hello. Um, before we get started here, if we could pause it real quick. Um, uh oh, looks like I might have to just go. Uh, all right. Well, my name is Andy. I'm from Midwest Organics Recycling, and uh, okay, I'll stop here. Can you everyone hear me? All right. Good. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to mentioned that, uh, you know, Doug was saying that he works with the uh, Windy City Harvest and Chicago Botanic Gardens and not particularly with the rooftop garden, but we supply the Windy City Harvest and all their locations, all of their compost uh, every year. So I think it's pretty neat that right here we have, we are pretty much connecting, connecting the cycle, repeating, um, you know, repeating the process and taking what people think is waste and turning it into a valuable material and putting it back in our soils. So I think that's really cool. And um, my bio wasn't updated. I have an 18 month old who I also enjoy spending time with. So just wanted to say that and I'll get going here. So here we have um, the beginning of our video, I believe so. It's okay. So Midwest Organics Recycling, uh, we are a 51 acre um, IEPA permitted composting facility. We're located in McHenry, Illinois. Um, we are, are permitted to take in food scraps along with horse bedding and landscape waste, of course. So we take in roughly about 125,000 cubic yards of material a year. And that split is about 70% yard waste, 20% uh, animal bedding, and 10% food scraps. Um, here's some pictures of kind of the, the usual material that comes in. Um, as you can tell from the other ones, we had the, uh, you know, the big municipal accounts as well as your local landscapers. And sort of the first step of the process would be grinding that material and breaking it down into um, smaller pieces to sort of expedite the uh, composting process. And from there, we mix it with our food scraps and other additives and make these windrows. Here you see the food scraps. Um, we take in about 9,000 cubic yards of food scraps a year, which equates to about 18 million pounds. Uh, so, you know, it's only 10% of what we take in, but we're, we're doing our part. Um, I think this video here, yeah, we're making some windrows. So once everything is sort of blended uh, in our mixing pile, we then make the, our windrows and here's our window turning, window turner turning uh, the material to speed up the decomposition. If we can pause this real quick, I got a little bit more details that I can go through here. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, as far as the, the, the active decomposition process really happens in the windrows and, uh, you know, we are OMRI listed for use in USDA certified organic agriculture. Um, and we have to follow some guidelines in order to do so. Uh, you know, I kind of make this analogy of the wind, or, you know, we're taking care of 
just like taking care of a child, like my 18 month old, we have to provide, um, you know, all these microorganisms and fungi and bacteria. We need to provide them shelter, water and food. And we provide that, um, you know, the shelter comes in the windrows. Water comes mostly from the material itself. It has a pretty high water content as well as uh, external sources such as weather. And then we provide them food by giving them the correct ratios of carbon to nitrogen. Um, and then uh, as we were looking at the windrow turning process, uh, you know, we need to give them oxygen as well because all these microbes, they use up the oxygen that is available to them. And once they start using it all up, their temperatures drop, they start dying off and the, decom uh, the decomposition process slows down. Um, so as far as the video goes, this is uh, a pretty important part because it, one, it, we aerate to give oxygen, but then we're also to incorporate the materials in that sort of internal zone where the most decomposition happens. And so we're able to evenly decompose our material uh, to get a final even end product, as well as avoid having material go anaerobic and um, you know carry pathogens or weed seeds with it. So some of those standards I was talking about is we need to turn our windrows five times within the first 15 days of them being made and ma maintain an internal temperature of 131 degrees. And that ensures that we don't um, you know, have pathogens that can be harmful to humans in our compost, uh, as well as killing off weed seeds because we don't want to sell compost uh, to a gardener uh, that has weed seeds in it. If you guys are gardeners, you know why. Um, and um, yeah, so it, you know, they're just the turning process is very important as well as sort of the housekeeping of these rows. You know, if material falls off and isn't getting incorporated, we, we clean up that material and get it back in. So it all gets thoroughly composted. Um, so yes, we can go ahead and continue the video. I don't know where we were at. I saw the um, in the chat real quick that people are asking windrows and windrows is just a term. It's an old farming term when you cut hay, you would uh, pile the material up in these small rows and to let the wind blow through it and dry it out. And that term has been sort of passed along into our industry as far as what we're calling a row, more or less. The row is about 16 feet wide by eight feet high and it's this fits the size of our turner. So we can keep going in the video. Oh, it's going, sorry. Um, you know, after about 180 to 250 days, we start screening our material uh, for sale. We have two different screeners to produce two different size of products. And the screening process takes out what we call the overs, which are the larger pieces of material, like wood, leaf debris, uh, and contaminants. And then we have our fine and sellable product. Uh, Pete and I decided to pick the windiest day of the year so far to do this. And you'll see all of our beautiful finds blowing away into the wind, which was unfortunate. But anyways, um, we sell about 20 to 25,000 cubic yards of finished compost every year. And that is not including what we put on um, our fields here at the farm. We are a sister company with uh, Golden Oaks Farm where we get uh, our dairy manure from. And last year we put about 50 to oh, about 65,000 cubic yards of compost uh, out onto our fields. So um, yeah, you know, we, we make use of our excess as well. Here's a, just a little shot that uh, so they took with the drone. You can kind of see some of our site. There's the windrows there. Um, we have our concrete pad. There's our little, little office building and our finished compost screening sort of operation. And yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, 
any, I guess we're gonna go into the Q and A here pretty quick. So I'll just leave questions for then. Thanks, Andy, that's great. Um, I also wanna thank you for explaining Windrows. I've heard that term for many years now and never understood what it was all about. So I really appreciate that. Um, so we do have some questions in the chat and I'm gonna pull up some of them. Um, so Jen Jarlin asked Doug about the grind to energy system. Does it take liquid out of the food before it's hauled away? It does not. So that, that's the, uh, the reason for it being a tank. It does not get, um, and actually we add water. It takes a fair amount of water to run the, the system. The grinder is probably uh, 60, 70 feet away from where that tank is. Um, so it, it actually, the water stays in, it's pumped through a pipe and then into that tank and then it's hauled out the same way. So it really facilitates the movement of the product. So no, water's still in it. Thank you. Um, we have a question about Midworth Organics making the compost on land. I know that lately we've had a problem with jumping worms. So can you speak to that concern, Andy? Yeah, so we, um, our composting pads are, you know, through our permit need to be semi-permeable. So uh, they need to drain a little bit and we're not really made on dirt. They're about a, uh, I don't know, some areas are probably about a four to five foot clay base. So, you know, there is dirt. We do get dirt in from our customers. We get leaves and landscape waste. We have uh, tons of material. I personally have not seen any jumping worms, um, sort of, you know, when I take samples or when I'm looking through material on the, uh, it's actively composting. I'm not sure why that is, and I have never had any uh, customers so far who have voiced any concerns or have said, hey, we got some compost, there's jumping worms in here. I'm not saying that there isn't. Uh, you know, I can't imagine a worm getting through the process, the way the material, you know, in a way takes a little bit of a beating along with the screen process, uh, but there could be eggs uh, going out and, it is something that we're aware of. It is not something we really have uh, a kind of action for. And um, I guess, you know, when we start seeing any sort of contamination, we have to visit that problem. But um, yeah, it's, uh, at least on our end, we're not seeing that uh, in our material. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, I'm with Extension and I know some of my colleagues in the northern suburbs uh, have been dealing with jumping worms, so people are not familiar. I think they're an invasive species that it kind of looks like a snake <laughs> and they do jump. Is that correct? <laughs> Am I correct in, in that explanation? Uh, yeah, they're like a little I, bit like a worm-like creature yeah, that's a little bit disturbing. I would be so happy to never know about these things, but here we are. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we do see like red wiggler worms in our uh, okay. material, which uh, I'm perfectly happy with. But as far as even earthworms, we rarely see. Um, so, uh, yeah. yeah. I think that our, high, high, high uh, temperature that you process the compost at probably assists in that process. So along with that question, um, someone asked if weeds and invasives could be put into the uh, do they get killed off in commercial composting? So if people are collecting yard waste, um, how should they deal with their, their weeds or invasive species? Yeah, so weeds and invasive species, um, you know, we, both, all the material comes in and gets processed uh, through our high-speed grinder. So we have a four inch grates behind our mill in the grinder and that breaks the material down into about four inch sizes or less. And so it's, you know, if you're talking about buckthorn or um, honeysuckle, you know, that's getting broken up into small pieces, which can't repropriate. As far as the seeds go, you know, I explained through the comp, uh, that initial composting stage and throughout the composting life, temperatures are maintained at 131. We usually about 155, you know, at our highest stage. And so, that um, pretty much kills off all weed seeds that either come in from the material or from birds or for the wind. Um, in my six years here, I've had one complaint about weed season. It was from a person who 
bought the material the prior year. So, um, you know, I have not seen any weeds or invasives um, affect any of our consumers. I use this stuff too. It's not, not an issue for, um, for us. So your answer is it gets killed off and uh, all mitigated through the commercial composting system. Yeah, so that's actually a great lead into the next question, which is where we can find your compost for sale since it's so high quality. <laughs> for sale. Um, currently, as far as I know, no, we don't ask too many questions when people buy our compost. So I don't have a great, uh, I guess, database of suppliers. Off the top of my head, there's Country Bumpkin Garden Center, which is in Mundelein, Illinois. Uh, they carry one of our products and they also bag our product. And then the other one is Red's Garden Center in Northbrook, Illinois, um, who uh, they carry another one of our products. Um, and can people and come to you directly and purchase them? People can yeah, that's what I was going to get to next. Um, there is one other company, it's called the Mulch Center. They're kind of a big outfit in the area. Um, they use our compost and a lot of their blends and they sell it, uh, you know, as, you know, pure compost as well. And but I think the best way would be come visit us and uh, purchase right out of our yard. Definitely the cheapest way. Definitely, thanks. Um, so we just have one last question and it's for Doug. Um, can you talk about your pre-pandemic edible food rescue program? So we're taking it back to repeat. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, and when we when we look at at um, how we divert waste, that that's obviously if we can reuse or repurpose the food, that's the the, the first goal. So so essentially, when we look at that, we we work with a number of different shelters so they can take the food, um, maintain the uh, safe to eat, and then we would donate that product out. So um, that never gets to the compost piece. But I did have one, one question myself actually for Andy and, and I, I'm not sure where it stands, but do you take, I saw the questions up in the chat box about uh, compostable containers. And I think the BTI uh, reference is a good one, but can you use containers in your in your stuff or is that because the- So as far as the Omri standards go, those products are not, um, I guess, permitted in a facility like ours. Um, but I guess don't tell anybody, even though there's 73 people here, but you know, if that material comes in in a load of, um, food scraps, you know, we aren't taking it out. Um, we do our, I mean, we do have a contamination. We have a couple of machines that, uh, remove contaminants and I bet, you know, the compostable flatware that doesn't get broken down in the process does get removed in that. Um, but I guess, yeah, we're, we aren't allowed to take it um, currently. And I know that that's something that the Food Scrap Coalition has been working on with Omri is to, uh, I think a lot of people are working on it with Omri because it poses a big uh, roadblock in the food scrap recovery and composting cycle. Yeah. Uh, you know, we want to be Omri listed because it's uh, good for our brand and good, uh, you know, to tell people that we're doing things the right way. But they uh, have not lifted the, those regulations quite yet. Yeah, that, that actually, so, so from my end, to be honest, that was a little bit loaded because I, you and I talked about it two years ago when I think we did a presentation um, before. And, and one of the things that, that's out there is that um, it's knowing who the people are that, that I would put out as a take action is know who your composters are, know what they can take, but they can't take how it works from their end. You have to understand what their business is um, so that you can you can participate as fully as possible and make your best decisions about what you get and, and, and yeah. what you purchase for that. Because if you're throwing off uh, the capability of an organic composter to sell their product, then that's not where where we want to go. And you know, how do you use that? How do you use that product? And you get something that they can use that way. So it's it's a challenging piece. Yeah. I, I hope that uh, that would be the other thing I'd put out there is that. You know, when you mentioned that the, the Food Scrap Coalition is trying to get them to change that, is that, uh, you know, I heard the earlier call to action at the beginning of become a member. Well, that's, you know, you got to give weight to the organization so that they can 
get the leverage they need to make political change that, that's critical to, to how we solve this problem. Because I, if you think about eight or 10,000 people coming in to eat lunch and they're all eating compostable containers, great. I, I, we spent the money to get the right container. It'll break down, it's BPI certified. It's got all those elements going for it. But then if, it, if it's messing up what Andy's doing on his end and he can't take the stuff you know, rightfully or can only take some of it, that's that's problematic to what we've all tried to do, and it's yeah. organizations like IFSC that are going to help us um, leverage our way through that politically and, and with legislation. Yeah, I think what I'll say there is I think that IFSC has done a lot of work and continues to do work to create trust between the different types of partners that we have. So understanding, like you're talking about communicating, making sure you understand what a partner can take or what a compost facility can take, and then making sure that 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 is communicated like, you know, statewide or wherever it needs to go. So once that trust and communication is present, then we can all be more trustful of what kind of compost we're receiving and what we can put on the ground. Um, we have another question uh, from Stephanie about you, um, this is for Andy, about you or other composters maybe using a certain part of a windrow as a place to test or like uh, segregate those compostable plastics and those, those different types of things. Um, and the way, so to kind of keep it separate, how do you Yeah, we have done, uh, I forget the company we did a trial for, but a couple of years ago, we, you know, had a windrow and used, um, you know, a, a sample of about 50 of their cups, 50 of their, you know, we, we took in a whole bunch of material and we placed in the windrow and did, did a test and, you know, I gave them, them my res results. Uh, um, so yeah, we, we have the capabilities to do that as far as a test, but in or, like the way that our operation works currently, it's very difficult for us to separate the material on an ongoing basis to have non omri listed compost with, with BPI certified uh, compostable flatware or serviceware and to have you know our standard operation. Um, it's something that I've thought about doing definitely um, it's just with our staff and our space, it's, it's, it's a little too much at the moment. And as a follow-up question, um, can you speak to the difference between backyard compost and commercial compost in terms of nutrient value back to the soil? Uh, it all depends on what you're putting in your backyard compost, you know. Um, I would imagine that a backyard composter is going to have more grass and more leaves, uh, then, you know, I guess on a scale of, or relative scale from what we do. Uh, I, to be honest, I can't speak to that because it is a, a kind of a feedstock issue and everyone's feedstock is different uh, mm -hmm. based on their yard and what kind of plants they grow. Great. Um, so we have some comments in the chat that you're tested with eco products. <laughs> so That's right. it's like Thank you are... for Amy, that. <laughs> um, one last question I uh, for now is are the liner bags that people use when they have compost acceptable in your facility um is it the same kind of question <laughs> yeah it's the same question I mean it's not something uh because I know that a lot of the programs are uh, especially with municipalities are put in place and um I guess the, po the political answer is no they are not allowed um, but we're not going to stop people from using them because it's better than a plastic bag. I'll tell you that. Absolutely. Lots of things are better than plastic bags. Um, great. So um, I really want to thank both of you for this really illuminating talk. I think thinking a lot about calls to action that we've heard throughout the day um, that are really interesting to think about um, gathering like-minded folks. So I know this seems like a really big you know, audacious goal to kind of connect these, um, you know, this relationship that Midwest Organics has with Saver is kind of feels like a really big, big thing. Um, so if it feels too large scale for you, I think one of the things that I would like to uh, challenge this group to think about is to think about smaller scale partnerships or ideas that you could have for partnerships between organizations in your life that maybe wouldn't be connected normally, um, but could be connected. And you can use your voice to talk about composting with friends and family and businesses that you care about who are interested in caring about the environment. 
Um, and don't know if Mary Beth Shea is on this call, but I'm going to call her out because every time that we go out to lunch together, she is always communicating with the wait staff and the um, managers about, uh, about of the place about how to um, talk to them about composting and opportunities for them to reduce their waste. Um, so there's lots of opportunities that you have as a person to be able to think about making linkages and connections with places that you patron and that you care about um, and just, just using your voice to be able to, to talk about those kinds of things. And the IFSC is here to help you find the right words, especially the communications committee. So that's my shameless plug there. Um, there's other, there's one more event this week. So if you have been with us all week, uh, thank you so much. But we've also kept the recordings. We've recorded the talks every day. So Grow, Eat and Compost are on our YouTube page. You can check us out. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat shortly. And then I'd also like to um, put on my day job hat and let you know that with Illinois Extension, we are also putting on a series of organic waste collection events this spring and summer. And our next event is May 22nd in Maywood. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat for that as well. Um, I think that's all I have. And Jen, you wanna, oh, tomorrow, I'm sorry. I was gonna talk about tomorrow. So tomorrow's talk is hosted by my wonderful, wonderful co-chair, Seth Katsaros. And she is going to be doing a live Q and A with some local, regional and national experts on composting. So these experts include Ginny Black from the US Composting Council, Dr. Paul Walker from Illinois State University, Erlene Howard from Collective Resource and Charlie Murphy from Midwest Compost. So we hope you can join us. Um, and we just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Jen, do you have other things you wanna say about our partners? I, I just wanted to make sure and um, give a moment to express our gratitude to our higher level partners. Um, you, you know, there's an opportunity for membership for individuals and organizations. And then these entities you see here on this slide are the ones that contribute at higher levels um, to help us do the work that we do. And it's, it's really important and really meaningful. It first and foremost allows us to keep Liz Bosarge in employ with us as our administrative coordinator. And man, she does so much for us. So just, yeah, thanks to Liz as well, but thank you to our partners who, who help us do everything that we do. Yeah, thanks everyone. We really appreciate you being here and we hope you've learned a lot. I learned a lot just today. I learned a lot all week and I've been doing this work for a long time. So we appreciate you having us. Uh, and thank you to Andy and Doug for all your expertise and for your honesty about the difficulty of this work and giving us hope for the future. We're excited to see when people can come back together and, and be together and make more compost. <laughs> well, Amy, so thank you very much. One last thing for, for those people that may not have dropped off when they're talking about taking action. You know, Andy had mentioned that he supplies all the, uh, the compost for Windy City Harvest. They're at farmers markets around the city. They have a, a shop down or store down on the, uh, at the farm on Ogden and you can buy their products down there. And that's another way you support Andy's operation and, and give back to the people that are doing the, the right things that you're trying to promote. So that's it. I have one more point as well. Um, this will be my shameless plug. Uh, yes. You know, you could visit our website at MidwestOrganicsRecycling.com and that'll have some uh, avenues of contact for us if you're looking to purchase some compost. And we do offer, uh, uh, now we offer a delivery service um, at different uh, quantities. So if you are interested in Having some compost delivered, we now offer that service. So visit us at our website, MidwestOrganicsRecycling.com, and we'd be glad to help you out. And okay, so well, I lied. I did have one more. I saw there was a question from Chrissy Christian, and she's asking about tours of the uh, garden. And absolutely, I'd wait a little bit later. Uh, just uh, the plants are coming up, but uh, uh, you want to come in like July or August when the, when the garden's really cooking along, so to speak. Uh, but you absolutely rearrange tours, and uh, if you drop a, if you check up on the website, uh, or drop me a line, and I'll, I'll get you in touch with folks and you can come up and have a look. That's Thanks, it. everyone. This is great. I think this is. I mean, it's really nice to see all these partnerships, and we're really excited to continue the conversation tomorrow. So come back if you can, and we'll see you soon. See you.